We're certainly glad you've joined us today. We do trust that our time together in God's Word will be a rich blessing and help to you as we look again to the pages of the Scripture to allow the Spirit of God to teach us from His Word. And I say that almost every time we, we begin our study together because our desire is to have God's Spirit teach us. But the Spirit of God doesn't just float around in a cloud and He doesn't just sort of, you know, lays around inside of our body and then every now and then go and give you some information. That, that, that's not the idea. The Spirit of God wrote a book, preserved that book through history, has caused it to be translated into our language and the language of the nations, actually. And it's through His words that He recorded in, 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 on the pages of Scripture that He teaches us. He already has said to us the things He needs us to know. He already has said the things that He wants us to know. Someone said, I wish God would, would, would speak to me. He already has. You see, there's a difference between understanding the sufficiency of the Scripture and, and, and not understanding it. When you don't understand that the Word of God is the complete revelation of God, then you're constantly looking for God to give you more information. You don't need Him to give you any more information. You need to get in that book that contains everything He wants you to know and then dig out the information, find the information. Now, that's why we talk to you about rightly dividing the word of truth, because the one verse in the Bible that tells you to study the Bible tells you how to do it. Dispensational Bible study, recognizing the distinctions that God has placed in His Word between His different programs, is the key to understanding the Bible. Now, one of the issues in which that is a, uh, a very helpful thing is the question about when the Lord comes, the, what we call the second coming of Christ. And there is a common idea, if you get your Bible and turn with me to Matthew chapter 24, uh, there's a common idea that in, in what is called in the Bible the Olivet Discourse. Two times Jesus Christ, one at the beginning of His ministry and one at the end of His ministry, goes up and has uh, a Sermon on the Mount. You'll recall in Matthew 5 that He goes and He sits on the Mount, His disciples come, and He teaches them, starts out with the Beatitudes and so forth, in Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is the famous Sermon on the Mount. Well, in Matthew 24 and Matthew 25, He also goes upon a mount, this time the Mount of Olives, the first mountain isn't identified, this time the Mount of Olives, and He sits with His disciples, and He gives another sermon. This time, in, in, in the what is called the Olivet or the Mount of Olives discourse, it covers Matthew 24 and 25, and it focuses on the last days of God's program with the nation Israel, especially focuses on Christ's return and how Christ is preparing His disciples to be ready for His return. Now, the question that comes up in, in, in Matthew is, are we a part of this as members of the body of Christ? If you've seen the movie series Left Behind, the idea in that series is that the rapture, the event we call the rapture, the, the catching away of the church, the body of Christ, Paul in, Galatians, in 2 Thessalonians 2 calls it our gathering together with Him. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 3, he says we're caught up together to meet the Lord in the air. That, that, that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and uh, and, and our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, when Christ is our life, shall appear, that you will appear with Him in glory. That event, which in Paul's epistles is quite different from His coming in cloud, with all the angels and the clouds of glory back to the earth to set up His kingdom. One is His coming to take the believers, the body of Christ, away from the earth back to heaven. The other is when He comes with the armies of heaven down to the earth to live here, to be Emmanuel, God with us on planet earth. So those two comings. And the question is, well, well is there really just one coming? Are there, are there really two parts to that second coming? And are we, is all that found in Matthew 25? Because the people that teach you the left behind idea use Matthew 24. Uh, you'll notice verse number 37. And you've heard this passage many times, I'm sure. But as the, day, as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark 
and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. There shall be two in the field, one shall be taken, the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, one shall be taken, the other left. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. There's the idea, one's taken, one's left behind. And that's where you get the title for that famous movie. Now you say, well, Brother Rick, you mean this passage doesn't have to do with the rapture, with the Christ coming for the church and taking one, the saved away and leaving the others behind? You know, you've heard all the horror stories about, you know, the planes flying over and, on, and the pilot and the co-pilot are taken away in the rapture and the planes left pilotless and... Uh, <laughs> It, it, it all, it's all good theater. It's just not good Bible, okay? He said, but, but, but isn't that what this is? Well, the answer to that is no, that's not what this is. You go back down to verse number 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall, be, give, shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of heaven shall be shaken and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. They shall see the Son of Man coming, uh, coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with the sound of a great trumpet. And they shall gather together his elect under the four winds from one end of heaven to another. Some years ago I went to a, a pastor's uh, conference in a large evangelical denomination. There are seminaries in the Chicagoland area where I live, and I was invited by one of their pastors to come and attend this conference. There was going to be a, a debate about Matthew 24, and, the, and it was, is the church the body of Christ a part of Matthew 24? In other words, are you and I a part of this coming? And one man said they were, and we were, and another said we weren't, and the one that said we were, he said there. He shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. First Thessalonians 4, he says, The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, and the trump of God. So there's a trumpet in First Thessalonians 4 with the rapture, and here is this great trumpet with the Lord's coming. They've got to be the same. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds of heaven. In 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 2, Paul says uh, the, that, that he's talking to them about... about uh, he, He's uh, communicating to them in regards to the coming of our Lord and our gathering together unto Him. And that gathering together unto the Lord, that's Paul's term for the event we call the rapture. Now we call it the rapture because in 1 Thessalonians 4 he says we're going to be caught up together. And that word caught up there uh, is, is literally, it's the idea of being snatched, pulled away by force. Uh, it's a fascinating word. In the, uh, in, in, in the text there because it's the word that's used over in John chapter 10 when it says no man can take anyone from the, the father's hand. The wolf comes and tries to snatch them away. There's this hungry predator that wants to make, wants to steal away the sheep from Christ, from the father. He, Paul uses that word the Lord, as it were, is hungry to have us with him. And he comes and snatches us away in his hunger to take us to be with him. He wants us to be with him more than we want to be with him. That's, that, that, you say, wow, that's, that's, that's some desire on his part. Well, that catching away. When you're caught up to be with the Lord like that, what would you call that? Would you call that joy, bless, you know, the, the blessed hope, the joy? So, yeah, so we use the word rapture for that, to be caught up. That's what rapture is about. I know it's not a Bible word. There's a lot of Bible words we don't use, you know, that we use that aren't right out of the Bible. If you want the Bible word, it's our gathering together unto Him. And the, and, and the doctor says, well, see, there we're gathered together to Him. And I thought about that, and I thought, wow, that's, that was interesting. Here's a man with a string of degrees longer as the arm, teaching in an evangelical seminary, sitting in front of 600 preachers, saying something that foolish. Well, look at that verse, Matthew 24, verse 31. He shall send his angels with the sound of a great trumpet. Now compare that with 1 Thessalonians 4, and, and, and you tell me if it fits. 
He shall send his angels with the sound of, 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 of uh, a great trumpet. Okay? 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with the voice of the archangel, with the, with the shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. Did you notice that in 1 Thessalonians 4, it's the Lord who comes with the trumpet? Who was it in Matthew that came with the trumpet? He shall send his angels. Well, now you tell me. If sending your angels with a great trumpet, is that the same as you coming with a trumpet? Well, the answer is no. It's not the same. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 1 Corinthians, it gets a little, little, little more difficult for the doctor. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in the moment, the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. See, here's this coming with the trump of God. Here's the trump. And the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed, for this incorruptible must put on incorruption, and this, this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So see, Brother Rick, there's the Lord coming with a sound of a great trumpet. That's what he says over here. He's going to send them back with a sound of a great trumpet. Hear the trumpet sounds. Well, that's true. But did you notice 1 Corinthians 15, 52? Once again, reading the verse is a little bit of a problem for the doctor. The verse says, 1 Corinthians 15, 52, In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound. Now, think about it. If this is the last trumpet, what does that tell you about how many trumps there are? That's right. There's at least two. In order for one to be the last, you had to have one before it. Look back, if you will, at uh, verse 45. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Verse 47, the first man of the, is of the earth earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. You see how in those two verses he identifies, the, he, he defines the word last as second? So when you come down to verse 52, in a moment, the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, at least the last trumpet is the second trumpet, which means there's more than one trumpet. But when you look at Matthew 24, verse 31, he says the sound of a trumpet. A trumpet, one trumpet, two trumpets. There's a difference. Uh, the way I count money, there's a difference, you know. If my wife says, give me a, a $20 bill, or give me two $20 bills, I know there's a difference. <laughs> okay? Well, the verses don't really compare. And that isn't all. This thing about the left behind. Go back with me to Matthew 24. Matthew 24, verse number 38. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So they shall also be, so also shall be the coming of the Son of Man. Then there shall be two in the field, one shall be taken, taken away, and the other left. So the, the taken away in verse 40 and 41 is comparable to the they took them all away in verse 39. Now the question is, where did they take them away to? So hold your hand here and come with me to Luke chapter 17. You know, the, the old saying, one verse is good, two would be better. If you want to understand your Bible, one of the cardinal principles of Bible study is, is to compare verse with verse. And when you have an account in Matthew and a parallel account in Luke of the same discussion, oftentimes you'll find in one passage something is defined in the other passage, clarified, amplified for you. So watch what he does. Matthew 24, 39, And knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So one is going to be taken away, 
and one's going to be left. Where are, where are they taken? Luke chapter 17, verse 26. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. Parallel passage. They did eat and drink. They married wives. They were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and, Matthew says, took them away. Luke says the flood came and destroyed them all. Oh, now I get it. When the flood came, it took them away in destruction. Now, if you've seen the, for example, the tsunamis that, that have, have struck the world in the last few years, the, the one that just struck, uh, that, that struck Japan, I mean, imagine the devastation. Some of the most amazing videos you could, I've ever seen. Uh, the one picture where, where the, the water is coming on, pushing just the, the, the black debris ahead of itself, going across a big parking lot with new Toyota cars and just picking them up and sweeping them away. And then there's a picture of the same parking lot later after the water receded and it's just a mud flat. Everything's gone. That's what a flood does. It comes and destroys everything in its path. These people, one's grinding in the field, one's taken away and destroyed, taken in judgment, and the other's left to do what? Well, come back to Matthew chapter number 3. I'm glad you asked. Matthew chapter 3, verse 11. John the Baptist says, I indeed baptize you with water into repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire whose fan is in his hand. He will thoroughly purge his floor. He's going to cleanse the nation. He'll gather his wheat, wheat's the good stuff, into the garner, and he'll burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. You see that? He's going to take some of it away, the useless part away in judgment. And then he's going to take the wheat the believers, the good fruit into the kingdom. So when it says some should be taken, the reason Matthew chapter 25, 24 rather, uh, and Luke chapter 17, when they ask him, said, where is he going to take him? He says, where the eagles gather, there's the carcass also. That's the carnage in Revelation chapter number 19 that's called the great supper of God. We have for, for seven months it takes to clean up that battlefield after the Battle of Armageddon. They're taken in judgment. And then the believers are left to go into the kingdom. No, what's going on back here? This left behind stuff, see, the dear doctor reached back into Matthew and in Luke and pulled out verses that have nothing to do with the body of Christ, nothing to do with the rapture, nothing to do with us. The body of Christ, the dispensation of grace, and the rapture of the church, the body of Christ, is not found in, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. It's certainly not a part of the topic of the Olivet Discourse. Now you say, but why, why do you say that, Brother Rick? Well, one is I can read. Two is I read a verse like this, Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16. And when I say that, I'm not trying to be facetious to you. Some people never read their Bible. They just listen to preachers and teachers talk. God help you. Don't just listen to me talk. Get out your Bible, look at the verses, and start thinking. You say, but I don't understand it. Well, then study a little bit. Quit trying to act like you've got to be fed with pablum, and somebody else has got to mix the baby food, warm it up, and stick it in your mouth before you can eat it. God never designed you to be dependent on other people for your spiritual nourishment. He provides pastors, He provides teachers, He provides people to help you, but He doesn't want you to be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine like little children who never grow up. And if they're not helping you to grow, which means they're not helping you to become skilled in the word of righteousness, Hebrews 5 says, then you need to go find you some teachers that do. Romans chapter 16, verse 25. 
not a hindrance of power to establish you. That's what you want. You want to have some spiritual establishment. You don't need another job in the church to perform. They can get somebody else to cut the grass for them. They can get somebody else to put the money in the offering plate. They can get somebody. You don't need that. You need to be established in the faith in an understanding of sound doctrine so your faith rests in an under, a clear understanding of God's Word to you, of who you are in Christ, and you're able to walk by faith in an intelligent understanding of God's Word to you. And whether you cut grass or whether you go past tracks or whether you give money in the collection plate or whatever you do, preach or whatever, you're doing it because there's some truth that's gripped your heart out of God's Word. And there's an outflow of his life because the Word of God is working effectually in you that believe. Now, the hymns of power to establish you, how is God going to do that? How are you going to experience the dynamic power of the working of God in your life? According to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, listen now, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest. There's some information that Christ never told anybody about until he told the Apostle Paul. Time past doesn't have it, but now it's made manifest. It was kept secret since the world began. Now, when God keeps a secret, come with me to Ephesians chapter 3. He's not like you and me. You and I can't keep a secret for anything. I was reading a thing just this past week. There's been some World War II British MI5 intelligence files from World War II were recently declassified, and they have a, a fascinating report of the Germans, the Nazis, tried to infiltrate America with some Germans who had been raised in America, and they sent them back here to be uh, agent provocateurs. And when they, when they got here, they, they basically just surrendered and, and, and gave up uh, but because they, they tried to defect. But the night after they were trained, the night before they were to be shipped out, the reason they caught about half of them was one of these secret agent men was in a, went to a pub, got drunk, and started telling everybody he's a secret agent. See, that's the way we are with secrets. We've got to tell them. God isn't that way. Ephesians 3, verse 9, it says, To make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world have been hid in God. God said he didn't tell anybody. You know what? I believe God. Verse number 2, Ephesians 3, 2, If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given to me, to you would have that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. Verse 5, Which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men. Something unique, something brand new, something previously unheard of was revealed to the Apostle Paul. It's called a secret. It's called a mystery. It has to do with the church, the body of Christ. Colossians chapter 1, verse 25. Colossians 1.25, Now I am made, where have I made a minister according to the dispensation of God which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which has been hid from ages and from generations but now is made manifest unto his saints. You see, Jesus Christ was not revealing information in the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He was keeping some information secret. About the, about the dispensation of grace and about the church, the body of Christ. And the reason that we're not located, the reason you can't find the rapture, the reason you don't find the body of Christ in the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the reason that the rapture is not in the Olivet Discourse in Matthew chapter 24 and 25 is because Christ hadn't revealed it yet. It's not there. And the reason... That, uh, that it's not there, is that God has two programs. One called prophecy, that's the way it's revealed, it's made known, spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. One called the mystery, kept secret since the world began. One focuses on his purpose with the nation Israel, one focuses on his purpose with the body of Christ, two different agencies. Now when you see that, all of a sudden, instead of being confusion, trying to take something that doesn't belong to you, doesn't talk about you, 
isn't appropriate for you and applying it to you because it's God's Word, you get over that. And you don't have to be burdened. You don't have to be bugged. And you don't have to be frustrated by trying to be somebody that you aren't. Romans 5 verse 8 says, Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. In Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he was a prophet and he belonged to Israel. He, he, he preached Israel. John 15, 16, Paul says, By the grace of God, that I should be a minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the Gentiles might be acceptable. Jesus Christ from heaven reached down and made Saul of Tarsus, Paul the apostle, and sent him to be our apostle. That's why Paul says, be ye followers of me even as I am of Christ. It didn't Paul, it's Christ, but it's that special message that Christ gave to us through Paul. That's for us to follow. You need to find in God's Word, right, invited who you are, understand who God's made you, and stand in that. Well, time's up. See you next time. Maranatha.